Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you're joining us from for another session of Surgery Live. Today we're going to be focusing on surgical endoscopy and the topic that will be presented today is a case of crippling non-cardiac chest pain by Dr. Kevin Revis from the Oregon Clinic. Dr. Revis is an esophageal foregut and bariatric surgeon and surgical endoscopist at the Oregon Clinic in the Division of Gastrointestinal and Minimally Invasive Surgery and serves as Clinical Associate Professor of Surgery at Oregon Health and Science University. Dr. Revis is an active leader in numerous national and regional societies. His research interests include diseases of the foregut, surgical instrument innovation, endoluminal therapies, and surgical education. He has published more than 70 peer-reviewed publications and numerous book chapters, and it's a pleasure to have him join us today. <clears throat> for our attendees today, from all over the world, thanks for joining us. Um, this is a great opportunity for you to actively participate. There will be several uh, opportunities throughout the presentation to ask questions of Dr. Revis, and this is designed to be an, an interactive session. We also want to thank our sponsor, Medtronic, uh, for allowing this great educational activity to occur. Without further ado, Dr. Revis, the floor is yours, and we're interested to hear about a case of crippling non-cardiac chest pain. Welcome. So again, thank you, Matt. and. Uh... Thank you for the Cleveland Clinic for the uh, invitation to uh, join you all today to discuss a, a case like you mentioned of. Excellent. No disclosures. Um, good. Excellent. So this morning we're going to discuss a patient who came and saw me a couple months ago. She's a 60 year old female hairdresser, highly functioning, energetic, um, you know, vibrant, embracing life. And she mentioned a 25 year history of some moderate dysphagia, but it's been getting worse. Um, recently, she's been losing some weight, but what she's really seeing me for was just this recent unpredictable, absolutely unbearable chest pain um, to the point that there are times that she simply couldn't get out of bed. She had been tried on all kinds of medications and acids and spasmodic medications. And there's a little bit of improvement, but really not a whole lot. Um, she even mentioned that the pain can be so bad that at times she bites her hand to distract herself from the pain, which kind of got me worried as to, you know, if there's some emotional instability here, or if this is truly just, you know, a, a case of, uh, um, you know, true anatomic abnormalities. Uh, she said she kind of described a sensation of painful reverse swallows on occasion where the pain would literally go from her chest up to her neck. Uh, she had been started on PPIs empirically and said that she had had some heartburn in the past and it seemed to get a bit better. Um, but she's absolutely desperate for definitive treatment, almost in tears in the clinic. Next slide. So why don't we pause there for a moment and uh, see what uh, folks' thoughts are on, on what's going on here. All right, so we have a lot of experts on the call today, and it looks like we span from Florida to Abu Dhabi and uh, and Tom Rogula in, in Poland too, um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna post this initial query to one of our more junior partners, and and, and drag the experts in later. So Mohammed Abdallah from uh, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, what do you think of uh, this case presentation so far? Hi, good morning, Doctor. Uh, good morning, Doctor Fs. I think it's maybe an esophageal source of pain. Uh, she's a young lady, uh, like I'm having an SGL dysmotor disorder, like nutcracker syndro uh, syndromes that may aggravate the pain. That's coming as non-typical chest pain. All right, how about Carlos Abril from uh, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi? I see the palm trees swaying in the background as a, as a more senior member of the faculty. What are your thoughts on this patient? Um, my first... Uh, it's a, the, the the beginning of the case, but uh, I'm I'm surprised the patient never ended up in the emergency department with a heart heart disease with a coronariography or something like that, which I think is one of the first um, steps that we we take any time we have a patient with this kind of of pain. Okay, I think there's a reasonable comments to get us started, Kevin. How about back to you? Why don't you tell us what uh... What your next steps were so um yeah she had um i, I like the fact that a 60 year old is considered young that's 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 good to hear 
Um, also, uh, she had she'd been evaluated. Um, her coronaries were were clear, so it was it was, it was pretty high level of confidence. This is non coronary in terms of the source. So, assuming that this was um, now you know through exclusion a GI source or potentially a GI source, we go through our typical workup for esophageal uh, disorders with endoscopy and esophagram, pH and motility uh, testing. Um, as uh, shown on these slides, here, these are all normal images of those type of things. So, so on endoscopy on the left, you can see a normal endoscopy with a regular squamocolumnar junction, a hill grade one valve, and there's no hernia, as opposed to representative image on the right side of a patient, um, uh, ours, for example, with a four centimeter hiatal hernia, but it's noted that our esophagus was quite snug just above the squamocolumnar junction. An esophagram on the left, you can see normal smooth contour with an open gastroesophageal junction down where you can see that large gastric bubble um, on the, uh, the right side of that left sided image. And again, no hernia. On the right side, you can see intermittent kind of bead and, and string image where you have the regular diameter of the esophagus interdigitated with, you can see this kind of atypical contractions of the mid and distal esophagus. And then uh, it's not really well um, projected here, but a four centimeter hiatal hernia. And again, those contractions are disorganized and, and quite um, um, exaggerated. So pH testing um, is an example of a, of a normal one. And her pH testing was actually normal with a Demetra score of 2.6, uh, a normal score being less than 14.7. However, her impedance revealed 78 episodes of regurgitation most normal um, you know, human physiology is going to be less than 47 episodes in a 24 hour period. So we're starting to wonder if this is a situation of stasis or as she essentially described kind of reverse swallows where the impedance catheter is being triggered by multiple events of non acid regurgitation as well as some potential acid regurgitation as well. What's interesting is that on 19, we'll call them events where she felt she had substantial regurgitation with heartburn. You know, she correlated 63% of the time. We consider anything more than 50% correlation to be a, a positive correlation. So, uh, although she doesn't appear to have um, pathologic acid regurgitation, clearly there's a lot of esophageal dysmotility going on here that, um, you know, put, could potentially be uh, the etiology for her symptoms. And then on her motility testing on the left, you see a normal um, esophageal motility, high resolution uh, topography with uh, as um, the uh, uh, colors go from um, left to right on, again, that left sided image, you see a smooth slope with the orange bar at the top representing the upper esophageal sphincter. And then the terminus of that slope at the bottom being the uh, lower esophageal sphincter with the time scrolling from left to right. So you see a nice smooth slope of, of a typical swallow. There's moderate intensity. You see, you know, the color bands basically in the uh, um, yellows and oranges for the most part. And again, no hernia. The, the slope at the bottom terminates basically where the hiatus is um, and the lower esophageal sphincter is essentially in that same, same um, region. Whereas on the right, our patient has essentially this pile driver type slope. Um, where you have just multiple repeated, I'll call them jackhammer, although we'll, we'll discuss, she actually doesn't meet the criteria for jackhammer esophagus, but just multiple repeated high intensity contractions. The actual specific distal amplitudes were not all that impressive, an average of about 139, normal being you know, really anything less than about 190. However, her distal contractile index or DCI should have a normal range around 450 up to about 4,500. And she was up around 7,500, uh, consistent with the diagnosis of nutcracker esophagus, as was kind of mentioned earlier. And you can see there's a, there's a bit of a gap comparing the images on the left to the right, where, where that uh, slope terminates. And then there's this beat of the uh, diaphragm uh, about four centimeters below, again, consistent with her hiatal hernia. You also notice that this um, swallow is not only uh, high intensity in terms of the contraction, and again, these repeated pile driver type contractions, but it's also quite prolonged. It, it goes out over, you know, well greater than six seconds in terms of its duration. So, um, again, just, uh, you know, adding to the evidence that um, this lady clearly has a, a, a pretty substantial motility, hyper, hypertensive motility disorder.
and as well as a hiatal hernia. So we're going to have two things to contend with in her circumstance. So I pause there again and chat about the, the workup so far and uh, and next steps. I see that uh, Dr. Rosenthal from Florida is on the call as an experienced uh, esophageal and gastric surgeon. I wonder what your thoughts are, Roel. Hey, good morning, Matt. Good morning. I'm sorry I'm driving if you have some background noise. Uh, is it so safe I'm to talk? I don't want to get you in an accident, Roel. Oh, no, it's okay. It's a Tesla. It's driving alone. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to see Kevin back. I haven't seen him for ages. And obviously, to welcome you back to the USA. Thanks, Roel. Well, I mean, obviously, this is a common scenario of a patient coming to the ER thinking of having a heart attack. They end up having an esophageal disorder. So I think this is something uh, pretty pretty common to us who are doing a lot of esophageal surgery and uh, not surprised. I think Kevin has so far done a phenomenal description, uh, a thorough workup. The big question is going to come what next. How much more are we going to study this patient? Uh, and what are the treatment modalities, you know, between observation, medication, or, or surgery? Uh, and then we're, obviously we're going to get into the poem or extended Heller's long myotomy for the jackhammer esophagus. Um, I, I sat in a little bit late. I don't know if the patient had an EGD already done, which I assume he did. Uh, so with a manometry, uh, with the EGD and a pH, uh, some surgeons might choose to get a, a, a swallow, you know, to get a little bit more of a graphic picture of the motility, since we surgeons don't always know how to read those colors in the manometries. Uh, so we like to see a shadow moving or not moving, see if the esophagus is dilated or not, see if there is a head or hernia or not. Uh, and then I think the next big question is going to be when and what to do in the OR. Okay. I, I think that sets the stage for uh, maybe Kevin's decision making. Yeah. Maybe, Kevin, you can walk through the spectrum of options, and then maybe we'll pull our other experts on the call. I think, thanks, Roel. Those are obviously timely and insightful comments. We appreciate that. So maybe we'll lay out some of the options, and then maybe we'll go around and figure out who would do what. Sounds great. So surgical options. We got two to consider here, as Raul pointed out. Um, and it's always great to, to see you, Raul, or hear you, Raul. Thanks for joining. Um, We've got two issues to deal with. So it's, it's not that this is an exotic circumstance, but it's kind of a combination of two relatively common problems in foregut surgery. We have a hypertensive motility disorder. Our options really are to continue to struggle with medical management, endoscopic management. And again, she came in tears to, you know, desperate for definitive management because she's been through the ringer already with our, with our gastroenterology colleagues. So, that motility test revealed that it's not a limited issue to the lower esophageal sphincter. We've got a problem of at least, you know, half to two thirds of the esophageal musculature. So just addressing this from the lower esophageal sphincter perspective is probably not going to resolve her symptoms. Um, options really described have include a long myotomy, that being, you know, one of, of the majority of the esophageal body. Um, versus a per oral endoscopic long myotomy, you're doing basically the same thing, but from a transoral perspective. You know, the, the advantage of the long myotomy, um, it's been around for a really long time, and, uh, you know, it's been fairly well proven, although long myotomy for hypertensive, myotomy for hypertensive contractile disorders like nutcracker, esophagus, diffuse esophageal spasm is a, you know, somewhat dubious track record in terms of improvement, unlike type 2 achalasia, which has a, a magnificent improvement rate. Um, for these disorders, the uh, symptom improvement is somewhere between 50 to 60 percent. But for patients who are desperate, have been through everything else, you know, oftentimes they're more than happy to try something that has a, you know, flip of a coin chance of improving their symptoms. Um, the illustration you see there on the right with the long myotomy does not include the myotomy across the lower esophageal sphincter, which I would consider a fault of, of that illustration. Um, and so we absolutely want to make sure any type of myotomy does come across the lower esophageal sphincter so that we don't end up pressurizing that fragile mucosa of the myotomized esophagus more proximally. Um, in the lower right-hand corner, you can see an illustration of a per oral endoscopic myotomy 
with the endoscope basically uh, snuck into the submucosal space and dissecting down, freeing up the uh, lower esophageal sphincter in this illustration. But you can certainly appreciate starting this up about 20 centimeters more proximally and, uh, and transecting the esophagus um, musculature, circular musculature up there. The question to keep in mind is, is this best approach from a thoracic perspective or an endoscopic perspective? And does anything else need to be done? So with that, why don't we go to the next slide before we um, poll everyone, Steve, and we'll look at our second issue, which we have a hiatal hernia. So if this lady didn't have rip roaring uh, esophageal reflux disease beforehand, you certainly would if you have a four centimeter hiatal hernia with the majority of the esophagus, including the lower esophageal sphincter being myotomized, basically opening up a garage door for a two way street of acid and gastric juices to wash all the way up into her neck. So this hiatal hernia we're gonna need to address with, we can either deal, that, deal with that laparoscopically or with an open repair, it's not going to fix itself and medicines certainly aren't going to resolve that problem either. There's an anatomic problem and she's gonna need an anti-reflux procedure after that. Now you notice despite the illustration below with the hiatal hernia illustrated and then the illustrations to the right with a Nissen fundoplication, a toupee fundoplication and a door fundoplication, I didn't specifically mention fundoplication in the text of the slide, you could certainly entertain other things like magnetic sphincter augmentation or endoscopic uh, transoral incisionless fundoplication. But the drawbacks of each of those with the magnetic sphincter augmentation being that you need to have pretty profound peristalsis. And we've just, you know, essentially um, handicapped her motility from that perspective. And then endoscopic fundoplication may be appropriate if you've got an intact esophageal wall, but in someone who's freshly been myotomized, that carries an unacceptably high level of risk. So um, with those thoughts, I want to pause again and see what folks think about those options. So I know that uh, Dr. Rodriguez is uh, kicking off our DDI docs meeting in Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. So this is a uh, plug for that as well. If you have nothing to do this morning, it's a great the CME opportunity. I'm also going to ask Dr. Aminian and Dr. Rogula. So I hope Dr. Rodriguez doesn't give all the answers out. But uh, since you have to cut out, John, what are your thoughts and maybe what are you favoring in this situation? Matt, and thanks, Kevin, for, uh, for uh, waking up early and presenting this interesting case so far. We're in the opposite uh, time zones here. Um, so, first of all, I think I want to back up a little bit and give you and your team, Kevin, kudos for working this patient up appropriately because most of the time when you look at, you know, these cases being worked up across the country, they probably would have not gotten an impedance study to begin with. And if they would have just gotten a, a standard pH study with a wireless motility capsule, her regurgitation episodes would have probably been totally missed. Um, so I think that when you throw that into the mix, um, and, and knowing that you're not really going to be able to treat her reflux with medical options like we typically do with patients with nutcracker who have acid reflux, um, I think your medical options are obviously going to be less, you know, effective and, and very limited. But I wonder in a situation like this, uh, when we know that a lot of these patients will respond to good anti-reflux therapy, if you want to combine a myotomy with an anti-reflux procedure or just do a stepped approach and fix the hernia, you know, do a partial fundoplication like a toupee and then just give her a few months and wait and see, knowing that you could always come back endoscopically and do a myotomy that way. Thanks, John. Um, excellent insight. Ali, I know this isn't necessarily your wheelhouse, but you're an accomplished uh, gastrointestinal surgeon. What are your thoughts on this case so far? Thanks, Matt, and thanks, Kevin, for presenting this interesting case. So first of all, uh, I was glad to see the upper GI. Sometimes we forget to order the upper GI when we have all these fancy tests in hand. So what upper GI showed the, clearly showed the esophageal problem. And I think we, we should always think of ordering the upper GI in these cases. In terms of the surgical procedure, I think one factor that we need to consider is that how much we are comfortable with option A versus option B or option C as a surgeon. If I feel more comfortable taking better care of my patient with option B, 
compared with the other option, I should go with the option B, regardless of whatever literature says, because at the end, it's going to be my technique and my patient and my experience in the OR. So, but overall, I would favor surgical approach, not endoscopic approach, because I'm not sure uh, if POEM can provide a long enough adequate myotomy for this patient. Uh, I would I would consider surgical myotomy plus partial fund duplication. All right, so we have two votes in. How about uh, from Poland, Dr. Rogula? What are your thoughts on this case? Hi, Matt. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Um, I, no, we, we know we ch have those kind of challenging and very frustrating situations. Uh, I actually have one recently, very similar, uh, but younger patient. Uh, so uh, our approach here is um, probably similar, but what I what I what I do is um, I set up some sort of uh, multidisciplinary team. Uh, with me and a uh, very experienced GI, gastroenterologist, who is endoscopies, and she can also read all of those fancy tests. And we also include psychology and psychiatry in the team and cardiology as well. So for this kind of situations, uh, I send those patients first to the GI uh, colleagues. They work up everything. Uh, we we'll meet uh, at some point and uh, we sort out some kind of uh, agreement what to do next. Um, and it kind of works. Uh, they usually come with some kind of medical solutions first. It doesn't work. We go to, uh, for surgical options. Now, in terms of surgery, obviously, I'm, I'm very biased uh, towards robotic surgery, and I have some quite good experience with myotomies uh, with the Da Vinci. So I would probably do this uh, with, with the Da Vinci, but I have no experience with endoscopic approach, so uh, I cannot uh, comment on this. But uh, robotically, I think it's, it's quite a uh, quite good option for someone who's doing this. Thanks, Tom. And I, I think just for uh, geographic equity, I see that uh, Dr. Lomenzo is on the call too. So maybe we'll flip it back to Florida. Manny, are you there? I wonder what your thoughts are. Yes, thank you so much, Matt. And uh, thank you, Kevin, for the presentation of a challenging case. Um, as mentioned, obviously, uh, these are two uh, relatively common problems of the esophagus that unfortunately are combined together and poses significant uh, issues in the decision making. I think the majority of our symptoms uh, obviously come from the spasm of the esophagus, especially the pain. So that needs to be addressed. And probably a long myotomy is the only option that we have aside of medical treatment that it's uh, usually not very helpful. But of course, we have a sizable hiatal hernia with significant episodes of regurgitation that need to be treated, on the other hand, with a uh, repair of the hernia and some sort of fundoplication. So in these cases, probably would favor a long myotomy, <clears throat> whether surgical or endoscopic, we can certainly argue about. And uh, I'm sure we're going to be presenting some data um, and then uh, perform the hiatal hernia repair with a uh, probably a partial phone duplication I uh, would consider a door in this case. Thank you. Thanks, Manny. All right, Kevin, back to you. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for their input, but I also preface it by saying this is pretty much a data free presentation. It is all about consensus. Um, but I think uh, all of you actually made some really fantastic points. And similar to this group, fortunately, I'm surrounded by four other outstanding esophagologist. And so I pitched this, we actually have what we call our comprehensive foregut um, committee, our conference, where we sit down and discuss challenging cases like this, because I know for those who know who I work with, there's oftentimes varied and robust opinions as to what should be done. Um, I think each of you mentioned, and the kind of the theme was, you know, do what you're comfortable with. Um, you know, the theme was basically, you know, myotomy, hernia repair, fund application in some order, using some approach, but the principles across the border, you know, get the job done using what technique you're most comfortable with. Um, you know, in, in my opinion, and you can go and bring up the, uh, the next slide there, Steve, while we're chatting, um, you know, being a, uh, an esophagologist and a, a surgical endoscopist, endoscopic approach is something that I'm most comfortable with. Um, an open thoracotomy um, is going to carry, obviously, some morbidity with that incision uh, through the chest. And uh, thoracoscopic and robotic surgery is something that I'm I'm less familiar with. However, in this case, a long endoscopic myotomy I knew would, would work well from that perspective. 
you know, to John's point about, um, you know, treat the uh, potential reflux issue and the hernia issue, um, I think uh, what was mentioned finally there about her, her chest pain was what kind of drove me as well. And I think the comment about the psychiatry or psychology issue is also quite relevant because I can tell you when she first mentioned, came into the office and I knew that she had likely nutcracker, but since she was essentially crying in the clinic and then mentioning biting her hand for distraction of symptoms, knowing many patients with distal contractile indices like this don't have this kind of chest pain, you almost start to wonder, is there something more going on in this story that may need to be addressed from a behavioral perspective or emotional perspective or whatnot? Most folks don't um, demonstrate that type of kind of uh, e extremist um, emotional um, concern. Um, fortunately, we can kind of dial right back to uh, the original um, anticipated problem, that being, again, a hypercontractile situation as the, the primary driver. So we started with a long uh, endoscopic myotomy. The photographs here kind of show the, the mucosotomy at the top, that kind of hole um, moving um, from uh, top right to top left and then bottom right, bottom left. Um, the next image to the right is simply in the areolar submucosal space. We're using the the hybrid knife freeing up the areolar space, the circular fibers of the esophageal wall are to the right. The mucosa is uh, off to the left out of view, which is just the way I like to keep it. Uh, and then the bottom left, you can see we're starting to basically cut through the cir thick circular fibers. And there's actually a little bit of, uh, I think probably got through the longitudinal fibers with some mediastinal adipose tissue there as well, which is really no issue. Uh, obviously a long myotomy done transthoracically, you'd be going through adipose tissue as well. And then the final image bottom right is of the endoscopic view at the end with the laparoscope on the outside glowing through that myotomized esophageal um, uh, wall with the, uh, with the mucosa intact, but the musculature um, uh, dissected free. And then to address the hernia, and you can see on that left side of photograph that sinkhole of a, of a hernia, it's not huge, but it's certainly enough that it would exacerbate any type of regurgitation um, post-operatively. We repaired that laparoscopically, uh, and you can see the, the right, the um, esophagus uh, having been immobilized, and there's plenty of intra-abdominal esophageal length. For the keen observer who says, wow, that is really one fat esophagus. Remember, we just myotomized her endoscopically, so there's a lot of CO2 in there and a whole bunch of uh, saline lifting solution in there, so it's an edematous esophagus, which makes it a challenge to close the hiatus and then do the fundoplication because you realize it's probably going to be half its caliber in a couple of hours as that uh, third space fluid goes away and the CO2 dissipates as well. So we close that hiatus and then you see a two-pay fundoplication, which is simply my choice uh, fundoplication. Someone who's had a myotomized esophagus now, um, you know, uh, um, uh, debilitated in terms of its motility. Proximally, I don't want to do a complete fundoplication. I'll do a door fundoplication for someone which I don't need to do a posterior dissection. But if I've already done a posterior dissection, I'll bring the posterior leaflet around. Um, into a 270 degree fund application. But again, it's a bit of a challenge to reconstruct it given the edematous esophagus, uh, but we we're able to do so. So, um, and as a result, this is her post operative upper GI. You no longer have that bead and string appearance on her upper GI. There's a smooth taper as the contrast goes through the fund application. She mentioned that uh, the result uh, was a greatly reduced sense of spasms. Her heartburn was eliminated, um, a combination of probably functional heartburn as well. She has an intact anti-reflux mechanism in place now. She mentioned about a month later that she does have some frequent belching, which you know what, I think we can accept that. And then occasional vomiting if she overdoes it in terms of the diet. She's still recovering. She's, you know, a month or so out um, and needs to uh, just recognize that we move slowly from liquids to puree to soft so to regular foods over the course of six or so weeks. Um, and then our follow-up is going to be an endoscopy at three months, which is still pending to assess she's off PPIs currently, but those nerves are probably shot. I want to see if she's developing esophagitis off meds um, with a partial fundoplication and a myotomized esophagus. And then at one year, we'll follow up with motility, pH, and a time swallow to assess at least interval uh, durability. So with that, we'll do a little wrap-up discussion because I know we're short on time, Matt. We're a little short on time, but maybe a, a question or two from the audience. We have a lot of people still on the call. Any any questions or thoughts for Kevin? Uh, Raul here, if I may make a couple of comments. Um, I think that Kevin mentioned something important. This is a data-free presentation. I don't think there is any data evidence that supports doing something right or wrong here. And probably if 
this question comes up on a board uh, examination, what the examiner wants to know is that you don't do something wrong because we don't know what's right here. Uh, and I think the wrong thing to do would be to narrow the gastric inlet. Uh, the right thing to do is to address the pain, which is what Kevin meant. I think a staged approach in surgery is always welcome. And we don't know here really if she needs a partial, a full wrap, an anterior or posterior. Uh, it's good to start endoscopically if uh, the surgeon in charge feels comfortable with a, with a poem. And probably it, it's the best approach because you can come all the way from proximal, which laparoscopically might be more challenging. Um, close that hiatus posteriorly nicely. I would not use mesh. I would use a partial wrap and see how she does. If the pain goes away and there is reflux PPI, if the pain, if the reflux doesn't go away, then the surgeon might consider rewrapping it. But uh, yeah, excellent approach, difficult case, and uh, thank you for for presenting it. Thanks, Raul. Those are great comments, and I think. Uh... Ali posted a question similar to something you just addressed, but I'll, I'll bring it out. Would it be possible to do a long and adequate myotomy through a transhiatal approach instead of transthoracic? Kevin, you want to comment on that? Raul just made, mentioned that a bit, but do you want to um, give a more formal answer to that? Yeah. Um, so the the short answer is, in, in my hands, no, um, based on the manometry findings. Um, you know, we realize that, you know, even with a hiatal hernia, we're probably able to access the distal five, six, seven centimeters of the esophagus fairly well. But beyond that, um, the visualization, um, even with the robot, is going to be somewhat challenging. And our motility we realized this disease process extended well up into her, into her thoracic esophagus, probably a good 10 or 15 centimeters. And that's just going to be out of the range of what we typically can get to from a transhiatal approach. Um, you know, in patients, unfortunately, with type 3 achalasia who have been denied uh, endoscopic myotomy based on insurance, where I've been essentially by hand forced to do a laparoscopic uh, myotomy, um, it's been pretty helpful, even if the proximal musculature is still intact. But those patients weren't presenting with chest pain. And as Raul pointed out, there's not a lot of great data, um, even in best case scenarios, long myotomy in this circumstance. We're still quoting 50, maybe 60 percent improvement in symptoms. It's not a slam dunk. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we are able to do quite a bit, you know, from a transhiatal perspective, but certainly with the endoscopic option, the ease with being able to facilitate that um, almost unlimited uh, myotomy from above certainly is, is nice being able to do that transorally. Excellent points. Well, thanks, uh, Kevin Revis from the Oregon Clinic for an outstanding talk. Thanks to all of our attendees and the robust conversation uh, and our, our wide geographic expanse, uh, real pleasure. Uh, so I also wanna make an announcement to join us for the next colorectal surgery live, which is scheduled for Friday, September 24th uh, from 6.45 to 7.15 Eastern Standard Time AM. And the topic is COVID positive and colon mass, now what? Presented by uh, David Rosen from Cleveland Clinic Fairview. And a monthly reminder that Surgery Live meets every Friday, with the exception of the first Friday of the month. Our specialties currently include bariatrics, breast, colorectal, surgical endoscopy, foregut, hernia, HPV, pediatrics, plastics, and trauma. And I also want to thank our sponsor, Medtronic, for the opportunity to present this educational program to you. Thanks all. Be well and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.